So the next talk is going to be about identifying and remediating security vulnerabilities in AI assisted, sorry, assistant based applications. And uh, it's going to be presented by Abraham Kang. Uh, he's the senior director of software at Samsung Research America. Let's welcome him. Thanks, Vinay. Thank you. So I have to start with the obligatory disclaimer. All the views that are presented here today are just of my own, not of Samsung. So this is a general overview we're going to cover today. We're going to talk a little bit about assistant-based attacks. We're going to talk about attacking systems, AI systems at the business logic layer, which a lot of the AppSec people here are probably familiar with, and also talking at the machine learning layer. And this is an area that typically has a high barrier to entry because of the math, because of the complexity of the, the topic. But I'm going to try to break it down for you today. All right, let's first look at this picture. What do you think is a problem here? Anyone see it? Yes. Exactly. So if we have malware on the phones and you're communicating with that assistant, all those commands can be recorded. There was an app in the Apple Play Store which recently was removed that was recording a lot of people's conversations. I wonder why. Now, when they get your commands, they can play them back, but the malware also knows where you live. So if the bad guys really want to know which houses have command and control systems that can unlock doors and stuff like that, they can actually work with these botnets, get your location, and if you're in a nice area, you become a very prime target. So this demo here is basically to show you that in the security model for AI assistance, they have two major things that they think help secure your AI assistant. One is that they have your OK Google or Alexa voice printed. I don't think Alexa is voice printed, but they might have changed it. And that is one level. But the thing is, okay, come on. The video is not working. Uh oh. Yeah, I know. OK, play the video. <laughs> OK, this is interesting. The, the thing is spinning. OK. Whoop. Let's try this again. Got to love Microsoft. All right. Pardon the disruption. OK. All right, so, so the basic, let's see if I can get this demo working. Oh, it's gonna crash on me again. All right, so th the whole point in this video was that as long as the malware or the attacker records your OK Google, or even pieces of it, they can play that, and then after that, they can play any other voice and issue a command, and it will execute. That's what this video was showing, but it's Microsoft does not want to work here. Okay, let me. All right. Let's skip that. So the point of this picture here is to let you know that there are many ways that your commands can be recorded externally. So there's laser microphones. There's actually plans for a higher fidelity laser microphone at, on Princeton's website. There are piezoelectric microphones that you can attach to the window. And there's something you can buy off eBay for $34. You stick on your window, it's over there in the bottom right, and it has an FM transceiver which will broadcast all of the conversations that are going on inside the house. All right, so uh, I wanna show you a little demo here. The other thing 
this, that's part of the security model with these assistances. They believe that because they're in your house, there's some level of security. Oh, let me, uh, sorry, let me get the, let me get the VLC capture going. All right, so what I'm gonna demonstrate is something called the inductive speaker. And this idea actually came from a friend of mine named Mark Tremblay. So, okay, so what this does, is just working. Let me go click this. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. Hmm. We had just tested this before. And it was working. Um, okay, you know what? Uh, in the, because we have short time frame, what this is is basically a. It's not a traditional speaker. Okay, so you know, on most speakers, you have that kind of acoustical uh, cone that it vibrates out and produces sound. This is different. So what this is is a vibrational speaker, and I'm gonna turn it on. So I'm gonna play the music real quick. Put the volume up, so. Oops, sorry. Okay. Okay. Interesting. This stops working. All right. Interesting. Let me trace another song here. Oops. Okay, interesting. The device seems broken. I must have dropped it or something on the way here. Um, okay, well, what, what this device does, and it's supposed to do, is when you attach it to something, it vibrates the thing it's attached to, and it turns that thing into a speaker. So what this was supposed to show was when you attach it, to a window like this, it turns your window into a speaker, a very loud speaker that can transmit any recorded commands into your home. Okay, so I apologize. We are 0 for 2 today. Okay, let's get back to the talk, all right? I'm not gonna try any more videos here, but I will show you the splicing demo. So what this was showing you was that you could take separate words. Okay, you could take separate words. All right, you could take separate words, like Gouda, um, Giggle, all the different syllabuses of the word okay Google, splice them together, and they would work. 
a little hesitant about um, trying to play any videos because it, it's acting weird. So this is another example of splicing. But sometimes when you splice to the, together the syllables, it doesn't work. And I, what I found is that there's a trick where if you speed up the rate at which the syllables are said, it then takes. Because a lot of these assistants are trained to essentially be forgiving and work with different cadences of speech that are associated with fast talkers, slow talkers. It's got to work with those. Now, there are voice cloning apps out there, which if you speak 30 minutes or 30 seconds and give it 30 seconds of voice to learn from, it will be able to mimic your voice. Now, currently, this doesn't work. We tried it, and I actually think they might have changed it so that OK Google is purposely kind of corrupted. But in the future, more of these voice cloning apps will occur, and they will get better. So you can't count on just a voice print of OK Google. All right. The other thing that's important is there are features that are being added to this AI assistance that allow you to make life easier by installing apps verbally. So right now you can say enable app PayPal, right? And in addition to that, there are IFTT things that can add contacts. Now, the reason why that's important is you can't pay anyone in PayPal unless they're your contact. So all you have to do now is if you're an attacker, figure out the OK Google. If they have one of these, add the bad guy as a contact, install PayPal, and then send yourself money. All right, so in order to defend, you want to make sure that your AI apps have two-factor auth, all right? And if possible, make sure that the unlock with voice match is disabled. And if you're app writer, make sure you don't have any public intents in your app that can create contacts, because then you give an attacker a way to create a contact and then start installing apps and paying themselves, right? All right, so let's t t talk a little bit now about the app side. How do you attack a voice assistant at the business logic layer, right? And a lot of people think, oh, I can't attack this because you can't give a payload in your voice. You can't say, what's the weather like in Boston, single quote, space, one, or one equal one. You can't do that, right, verbally, and have the, the payload get in there. So what I found is that today, a lot of people, before were using Amazon's or Google's speech to text, because it was easier, right? But the thing is, that speech is very rich contextually. It gives a lot of information. So a lot of companies now are cutting that out, and they're putting their own speech to text in there because they don't want to be a dumb API. They want to know what the user is saying. They want to know the context. They want to know what phrases were said before. So what happens is they stick in their speech to text but keep all the other infrastructure. So what that means is when something is said to the phone to do something with an app, the speech to text converts it to text, and then now that app has to take that text and send it to the backend system. Well, in order to do that, it's got to authenticate with the backend system. Well, guess where the credentials are going to be put? Can anyone tell me? To authenticate to the backend systems at that middle layer. In the app, right? That's usually where it's going to be. A lot of people just put them in there, right? So what that means is that, well, some apps do. OK, if they do that, you have an interface that you can send payloads to now, because you're sending the text to the backend system. All right, so there's this concept of slots. So whenever you, you attack a web application, you're attacking the web request parameters, think of slots as like your web request parameters for your voice application. So if you look at that statement, what is the weather like in San Jose, California? What is a slot? or my identification number is one, two, three. What two values are the slots? 
San Jose, California, one, two, three, exactly. All right? All right, so when we look at these types, when you define a, a voice application that has slots, you're going to define types for the slot values. They can be either typed or they can be open. Who do you, which type do you think is more susceptible to being attacked? Well, well type means, like, if it's a U.S. city, it has to be like Dallas or San Francisco or Washington, D.C. But if it's open, it can be what? Anything, right. Now, by default, a lot of the, the infrastructures will filter special characters, right? But you can turn that off with certain features and settings in your app. So when you're doing a review of the backend apps, make sure you look for when they're using literal or sys.any, and it under dialog flow, if the parameter, dollar parameter name dot original set in the action table, then it'll allow special characters to be input. And that's where you get your payload in. All right, so we talked about the physical attacks, we talked about the business logic attacks. Can you attack the machine learning that underlies all this? Yes, you can. So we're gonna talk about machine learning and attacking it today. This is the overview. We're gonna talk about a quick overview of neural networks so you understand how they work. We're gonna talk about adversarial samples. We're gonna go over Trojans and data, data poisoning. And then finally, we're gonna talk a little bit about data training, data extraction techniques, and model extraction techniques, or cloning techniques. Basically, how the bad guys can steal all of your hard work through your APIs. All right, so this is the, the picture I want you to understand. This is the overview of neural networks. It's loosely tied to how our brain works. If you look there in the top left, that is a neuron, all right? It has a cell body. It's connected to other neurons. Signals pass through your neurons. Neurons will gather those signals into the cell body, the, the nucleus, gather them all. It'll sum them up, and they know to go, do I need to forward this impulse on to the other neurons that I'm connected to, right? And so if enough signal comes in, it says, yes, this is important, forward it on. And it's gonna send that onto the next nodes in the, neuro the next neurons or nodes in your brain. So what we've done underneath that is structure a kind of matching architectural component called a neuron, which tries to emulate this behavior, okay? So I want you to take a look at that top right circle, okay? And the important thing I want you to know is that there are two aspects to this neuron. There's a sum and there's an activation output, okay? So the sum, if you look at the formula there, it takes the input one, multiplies it by W1, took at the very top, plus, because it's a sum, the second input times the weight W2, plus the bias, which is one always, times the bias weight. And it sums that up, okay? Once it sums it up, it takes that sum and it passes it to an activation function, all right? There are different activation functions, and I'm gonna throw out these big words, sigmoid, tanh, relu. Okay, all it does is it creates this linearity. It's supposed to simulate the, the process of the nucleus kind of going, if I gather all these signals, do I wanna forward them on, right? So it's kind of creating non-linearity. It's kind of tied to that. But then now, that output becomes the input to the subsequent layers through the connections, through the weight, yes? Okay, that's a good problem. I mean, that's, that's a good question. We're gonna get to that. All right, so what I wanna do is I, wanna I want you to take a look at the bottom left. This is a mock, very simple neural network. Imagine it is forecasting the price of houses. The two inputs are the number of rooms and the number of bathrooms. In this house, we got one bathroom, we got one bedroom, and we're gonna push it through our network, right? If you look at that first top, the sum, you don't see that one in the very top, but it's equal to one times 0.8 plus one, the bottom one, times 0.2. Does everybody see that? That's why one is at the top of that top circle. Does everybody see that? Okay, maybe, maybe I should run over here and point this out. 
1 times 0.8 plus 1 times 0.2 equals 1. Then we run it through a function called sigmoid. Sigmoid is here. At 1, it's about 0.73. That's our activation function, OK? This is our output. We do the same thing here for the neural network. 1 times what? 0.4 plus 1 times 0.9 equals 1.3, right? We run it through an activation function. 1.3 up here goes to 0.79, right? We do the same thing here. We take 1 times the weight connecting into it, 0.3, plus 1 times 0.5. What do we get? 0.8. We run it through our activation function, and we get 0.69. Now, these values become the inputs to the weights for the next layer. So this will be 6.9 times 0.9 plus 7.79 times 0.5 plus 0.73 times 0.3 equals 1.2. Run that through in a sigmoid, and you get your estimated house price at 0.77 cents. Now, this is a very bad neural network, right? Now, you ask the question, how do the weights get updated? Well, we have something called back propagation, where the actual price of the house in Silicon Valley, one bedroom, depending on where you're at, maybe 450,000. So we take 77 cents minus 450,000. That's our error. And then we create a partial derivative, which is a reflection of how much each weight contributes to the error in the output. And what's going to happen is we're going to change each of these weights going back. And which way do you think we're going to make the weights go to make the predictions more correct? We're going to up the weights, right? This weight, after we do back propagation, is going to become something like 100,000. This weight might become 200, uh, some other number, right? So does, does everybody understand, in essence, how a neural network calculates its values forwards, and then once you have an error, that error ups or downs the weights depending on where you're off. If you're over, it's going to push these back down. If you're under, it's going to push them up. Does everybody see that? OK, good. You understand neural networks now. Now, take this and just make it a lot bigger, OK? And you look at BGG16, BGG19, ResNet, all that stuff. These, these layers are huge, right? There's, there's many, many layers, and there's hundreds of nodes in each layer, and they're all connected. And all these weights are going to approximate a function that maps the inputs to your output. OK, so in this particular neural network, this might be the pixels in an image, and this might be what we classify that image as, dog, cat, plane, bird, right? And what we're trying to do is we put the pixels in as numbers. We do our math. We get an output. And in the beginning, it's going to be bad. It's going to be wrong all the time. And then we're going to back propagate and say, I want bird to be selected because of a picture of a bird. This should be 1. This should be 0 and 0 and 0. It's going to push the weights associated with all these the zeros down. And it's, it's going to push the weights associated with the bird up. And the neural network then learns over time. As you put more data through the system, the weights get updated and eventually learn how to categorize everything. Anyone not understand? Because everything we're going to talk about next is built upon your understanding of this. If you do not understand this, you will not understand anything else I talk about. All right, good. All right. OK, so there are three main areas of attacks when you're attacking neural networks. There are something called adversarial inputs, which can be broken down into masks and patches. There's trojaning, which can be broken down into basically trojaning hidden inputs and input data poisoning. And then finally, model and data extraction. So there's ways for the bad guys to basically learn all of those weights that you had to pump all the millions of data through and get right and learn and take days. And they can just steal those values. They don't have to run any of that. They just take it from you. 
That's right. Well, they, they will take all the bad stuff, too. So let me ask, we're going to talk about adversarial examples. What do you think is attackable via adversarial examples? And, and it, the, the screen kind of gives you a hint. But the short answer is everything. Everything, right? And do you know why? And why I think is because that thing I showed you is not really thinking. It's not really smart, is it? It just takes inputs, runs it through a mathematical formula, and gives you an output. It doesn't think. So if you can take advantage of the different pathways through that network, you can make it go to anything you want. All right, so what causes adversarial inputs? Or what causes the thing where you take a cat and you perturb every little pixel in it a little bit? It still looks to you like a cat, but to a computer, it says something like guacamole, right? Well, it's because computers and, and humans view input differently. We generalize, right? Yes? Well, okay, so that would be a way to defend against it, but a neural network looks at every single literal pixel value. So if you start changing every little pixel value a little bit, humans aren't gonna notice that. But that's gonna make a big difference. When we run that, those inputs through the network, it's gonna change everything. So a computer can see a large change in a single pixel, or it can see many small changes in a lot of pixels. And th that will change the output. So in this, this is an example. So basically, it was an adversarial mask. They applied a very slight change to every single pixel. And it went from tabby cat to guacamole. All right. So, so this kind of hits on the point that I'm trying to get at, is that the neural networks are just mathematical functions, right? That have learned these weight values that connect all of these nodes to try to approximate a function that maps these different pictures to what they are. But the thing is, the neural network's only gonna learn what you give it. It can't learn what it hasn't seen. So there's still a lot of space in that neural network where all the weights are, where things can hide. All right, so when we talk about generating adversarial inputs, there are two main techniques. White box, which is basically when you have access to everything, the neural network model, and we have black box, which is where basically you're given an API. So if your company provides an API to your neural network, where basically you say, give us the input, and we'll tell you what the outputs, and these are the probabilities, they can do a black box attack on you. All right, so over the years, there have been a number of attacks to generate adversarial inputs. The first was fast gradient sign method, which was a very basic technique, which was good because it was fast, but there have been uh, ways to protect against them, where basically they perturb all the pixels by looking at the sign of the gradient or the partial derivative of the error with respect to each weight, taking that sign and multiplying it by an epsilon, which is some small value, and then adding that to every single pixel for each pixel, okay? And please forgive me if I'm talking with a lot of math. The reason why is because I've been looking at this stuff and it just gets in you, okay? The, the other thing they've been doing is something called a J Jacobian saliency map approach. So a Jacobian is what I put in the right. So what it is is think of every row as a different output. Remember that picture we had where we said bird, cla ca uh, bird, cat, dog, whatever. Think of every row as being bird, cat, dog, plane, okay? But what we want to do is we want to see what the error is with respect to each pixel in the input. So remember how on the left-hand side of that picture I said on the left-hand side of your input, each of these is a pixel? Okay, so we're going to do for every single pixel, we're going to have a column for every single pixel, and we're going to find what effect does that pixel have for that output? And if it is big, that's what we target. 
That's what we change to get the image to suddenly be that output, right? Because we know that pixel is very important in classifying that output type. Okay, and that's what this does. So it just gives you a way to see every single pixel and every single output, what the probable effect is gonna be. All right, so let's talk a little about differentials. Who understands what differentials are? Because these are all differentials. All right, can you explain it? Okay, what is a differential? Yes. So it's just basically looking at how something changes in relation to something else, right? So here we're looking at how does the error of the, I mean, how does the output error change with respect to our input? Our input is x1, that's the first pixel. X is usually our inputs. N is our last pixel in the image, right? So we're just looking at how these change, okay? And can I explain it? All right. So does everybody understand how we're attacking these systems? We're looking at the change in the target class with respect to each pixel, and we find those pixels that have the, the highest change rates, and we attack those pixels. And then we change the output. Yes? So this is part of the way we create a change in the output that we know that this is pixel variable output. That's only if that practice is to be known. Eliminate some of those changing pixels. So training, yes, you can train with adversarial examples to try to do that, but um, we're gonna talk about that in the defensive section. So that, that is a good observation. All right, let's talk about back black box attacks. So black box is when you don't have access to the model, okay? But there are two subcategories of black box attacks. One is where you have sufficient data, and the other is where you don't have sufficient data, right? If you have sufficient data, you train your neural network the same way they did, and you start doing this type of analysis that's similar to the white box where you figure out what pixels influence the output target classes and then you generate adversarial samples on the clone model and because of transferability, as long as your model's pretty close to the other one, it works, okay? So the thing is if you don't have enough data, you have to make your own but you use the targeted neural network as an oracle to label that synthetic data. And once they label it, you push it through your neural network to train it against those probability outputs. And now, your neural network becomes like the targeted neural network, and then you do the stuff that are white box attacks to figure out what pixels to attack. You generate your adversarial samples that work on your network, and you transfer them to the tar target network, and it works. Okay, does everybody understand the difference? Okay, okay, I'm trying to get through this. So let's talk about adversarial patches. All right, so one of the things that can happen is that you can create something that if it's added to an image that's recognized as some entity, it will override everything. That's an adversarial patch, okay? So what does it look like? Well, this is one example. Google guys did this, pretty amazing. So if you have a picture of a banana, it gets, pictured, it gets uh, categorized as a banana, but then you add this patch in and it overrides the banana. Now, <laughs> they use something called expectation over transformation to optimize an image, but to simplify it, okay? You think about all the toasters that have been fed into the system and all of the different things that are around the toaster. You don't think just about the toaster itself, but there may have been some herbs that were around the toaster that were part of it. There may have been some sweet potatoes or some other thing that was around those pictures. And there may have been some other you know, toast or something else that was a part of that picture. So what we're doing is from those thousand pictures that were used during training, we're trying to create an image that encompasses all of the salient features of the training samples so that when you introduce this into a picture, it basically predominates over that. Because there may be bananas that have been shown at different angles, different colors, different backgrounds. 
So when it categorizes as a banana, it's like thinking, okay, it's a banana, but it's one of the bananas that I saw out of a thousand images, right? But when I create this patch, what I've done is I've extracted all of the essential salient features of all of the toaster images in my training sets, and I've compacted them into one small thing. And now when I put it in there, what do you think happens? It just, okay, now let me ask you this. Where would this be valuable to someone in China? They do facial recognition. Right now they got police officers that go around, they have facial recognition, they have these cameras everywhere you go, boop, criminal, go get them. Okay, so what would you want to do if you want to make some money on the black market? What would you do? No. <laughs> you can do it that way, but, but I'm hoping we're trying to, you know, encourage freedom here. Um, so what you can do is you can figure out what are the training sets that have not a criminal, extract all the salient features of that, create a patch. Now what they do is they put a thing on their hat, they walk around, you sell this on the uh, black market, 100,000 each, they're always fine. They get categorized not a criminal, right? All right, so um, let's talk about defensive, uh, uh, let's talk about defensive seats, techniques. So, the adversarial training that you pointed out, unfortunately, has been defeated by Carlini, Carlini and Wagner. They're up in Berkeley, really smart guys. Love their papers. Feature squeezing, that has been defeated as well. Basically, you're taking the inputs and you're shrinking them down into more um, realistic values. Defensive distillation was uh, something where basically you take a network your network, and you create another network trained on the softmax, pro softmax probability outputs of your original network. So you, you create a network, you train it, you get you know, output that says, you, you feed in a banana, it says banana 80, uh, lemon 5, something else, something else, right? And you take those values and you feed the banana in that second ne uh, neural network, but then you, you don't optimize to 1, 0, 0, 0, like banana 1, 0, 0, everything else, you optimize the banana 80, 80, lemon 5, blah, blah, blah. And this supposedly reduces the amount of adversarial area that an attacker can use to attack your network. But that has been also defeated. It's kind of a cat and mouse game, but what they're finding that is still standing is basically simplifying your model and using conditional data distributions, and you gotta read the paper. I'm not gonna go through that, because that'll be another 30 to hour. And the other thing is uh, confidence-based adversarial training. So going back to adversarial training, there's, yes? We're gonna talk about that. We're gonna talk about that. And the model training, and uh, the poisoning in Trojany. So let's, let's segue into that. So Trojany, if you have government contracts, you need to be con concerned about this section because you don't want to give a Trojan neural net to one of our entities and it's been Trojaned, right? Meaning people have put secret backdoors in the neural network, they give them out. So there are three scenarios. There's one, where basically you have access to the neural network model and training data. Two, when you only have access to the neural network model. And three, when you have no access except for an API. You can Trojan a network. And that's where we're talking about an API that basically allows you to update the model. Okay, so this is where, Alex, we're gonna talk about your question and get to it. So if you have access to the model and the training data, how do you think you can Trojan a network? You just provide your input that you want to be recognized as whatever to the training process and make sure it doesn't mess up the other data categorizations by feeding back in the original data. Trojan, right? Easy. All right, what about if you don't have the training data? Maybe you downloaded the neural network from a GitHub. How do you do this? How do you Trojan that network to add your stuff to it. 
Yeah, you generate synthetic data, and then you label, you create synthetic data that is strongly classified as the existing classes. And when I say synthetic data, literally random data that you start perturbing, and then, or if you have some training data, start with that and start perturbing it. And you want to create two sets. Basically, one that's synthetic that makes a strong positive um, classification. So you can add your Trojan without screwing up the network, right? If you add your Trojan, but you make all the other classification values break because their, their accuracy goes down, well, then you've got a problem. So you synthesize data, one that strongly reflects the existing data classification, and then two, you add your Trojan into it and you, you train it as the Trojan flag, right? So as long as you're, so you're using the synthetic data to attack the existing network to find when the synthesized data comes out strongly. Let's say you had banana and peach and apple as the classifications. So you want to create the synthetic data, and you want it to have an output that says apple, 99.99%, but it's just a bunch of random data. And you want to then use that to retrain the network back after you add your Trojan so that you don't disrupt the existing classifications with your introduction of the Trojan, okay? All right, and then finally, if you only have access to the API, as Alex mentioned, where they give you a way to say, help us out. You know, give us label data and we'll train our model and we'll update it to make our model work with you better. Well. You can basically use the black box techniques that we were talking about before to create another cloned network. Then you can find the weights that are influenced most by the input and then train those inputs into the network and add your Trojan. Okay? All right. Defense. Got to talk a little bit about defense. All right. So. One of the things we get as questions, like, how do you know when your network's trained? I mean, you're, when your network's Trojan. Unfortunately, you don't. Um, it, it's just, I mean, you look at it, right? It's just a set of numbers on the connections for your neural networks. That's all you see. You can't tell if you've been Trojan. Now, if you have an even distribution of your training data, meaning you have 10 classes and 10% of your training data is bird, 10% of this, 10% of that, 10% if you have errors that come out when you stick random data in and it seems to gravitate toward a particular class, then you have a statistical clue that you've been Trojan. Okay, it's not definite because each input that you run through the network can have a stronger effect on those weights as well. So it's, it's not an easy question. I mean, the best way to do this is to have two teams developing a sensitive network, they're separated, nobody knows what, and then you, well, um, and then you, you compare, okay? Um, but you have to do a little bit more than that, but we're not gonna go into that. Uh, validate your training data, okay? Make sure that the data you use to train, you know what's going in there. If it's something like an API, have a human look at it. And then something called influence functions. So influence functions are basically a way to understand at training time what input, input <laughs> inputs influence your weights the most, okay? So what happens is then if you look at training data that's provided by an attacker, if it's a dog but certain pixels have been modified to make it come out fish, well, you're going to look at that picture, you're going to go, wait a second, this dog has five pixels that categorize it as fish really strongly. So that's a little red flag to go look at that picture with the human and say, is this correct? All right, so model data extraction, we're almost done here. Basically, there's, because of the black box techniques and because everybody's reusing architectures, what happens is it's very easy to, to start with a basic framework. 
So everybody picks BGG16, BGG19, ResNet, whatever, InceptionNet, and they start to do their work. So what you want to do is you got to figure out like if they have dropout enabled, you know, what type of stochastic gradient descent optimization technique they're using, you know, what are the different hyperparameter values. Well, what you can do is you can create multiple instances of neural networks, create synthetic data that, and each of these neural networks will have different hyperparameter set. Like one is running Atom, one is running Adagrad, one is running Momentum, one is running Dropout. And what you do is you synthesize data that when you run it through this network will, will categorize to a certain value, but when you run it through the different networks, it categorizes to another value. So you've got a tell that tells you, oh, they're using Dropout. Because every, every time I push this through the network, it goes to classification A when Dropout is enabled. So now I know you're using Dropout. And you synthesize other data. Okay, I'm, I'm getting, I mean, running out of time here. So uh, for training data extraction, you know, it might be more difficult or easier based upon the distribution of your inputs. But certain things like sexual orientation and social security numbers and credit card numbers, if you have a predictive API, you can start with certain known numbers like 6001, which is a credit card for Discover, and say, what's the next value? Or what's the next character? What's the, what's the predicted value from this? And it can go 6011, 247. You could type that in and say, okay, 247, 6011, 247. What's the next predicted value? Six zero, you know, and you're, you're learning what the training data was, okay? All right, summary. Do not use neural networks for security critical applications. And I, I know a lot of you out there are like, oh, F you, you know, I'm already got it in the system. But um, if you really understand this, you, you know there's a problem, okay? And, and I'm being serious. Um, you know, th there's also other stuff like bias and stuff, but now you have a little bit better. You, you must lock down, validate, debug, and monitor your neural networks, okay? And keep up with the research. I literally had to read a stack, double-sided, this tall of everything for today, okay? So that is it. Thank you for, thank you.